Welcome to our second lecture in cultural anthropology. Uh, what we're going to look at uh, today is kind of the different schools of thought that we have in anthropology and throughout the development of anthropology as a discipline. So we're going to look at different schools of thought as well as kind of a brief historical overview of anthropological thought as well. So you may be asking what kind of spurred the development of anthropological theory or what really spurred um, social you know, scientists to really kind of um, start to have a real interest in the humans of the species and more importantly, human cultures. Well, this is really kind of driven by this age of discovery, right? When we started setting up international trade routes, these kind of uh, sailing routes for spices and other things, um, people from Europe as well as Asia, as well as North and South America began to come in into contact with each other, right? So this age of discovery really occurred between the 15th to 19th century, and it really defined finds a period of time in which European nations vied for economic and political power by conquering foreign lands and expanding global trade, right? And as part of that, they came into contact with different cultures and scientists began to start writing about those different cultures. This is showing you just some of the famous exploration routes that we're taking. Um, you can see Columbus's route in 1492 um, in the kind of uh, purple coloring there. Um, but these were later routes that were we kind of call now uh, routes of exploitation, right? Because in setting up a lot of these initial colonies, those European powers uh, generally didn't treat the native indigenous people um, with much respect nor uh, very well. So it ended up uh, being kind of this grab for resources were these European powers, and in some cases they actually went and enslaved the native people to kind of work on their plantations as well as provide them with economic power as well. So the age of discovery was started by kind of these Portuguese traders that were trying to find a more efficient way to get to the Indian subcontinent, right? At the time, sugar and nutmeg uh, were worth almost their weight in gold, right? So some of these spices were kind of these luxury items that were in very high demand in Europe. So as communication and transportation technologies evolved, European nations were able to explore the new world using long distance sailing ships. And the Portuguese Portuguese sailors would bring back tales of peoples and cultures that they encountered during these voyages. So by the 19th century, enough interest was sparked amongst European scientific community for anthropology as a discipline to form. But at this point, uh, was the interest really purely scientific or were there kind of culturally laden um, theories and cultural laden hypotheses that were coming out from the early days of anthropology? So much of the early days of anthropology from the early 18th century all the way through the mid 19th century, um, a lot of the hypotheses and theories that were coming about, out about why there is variation in culture and why there is differences in humans were really kind of uh, race laden, right? In essence, what early anthropologists were doing were trying to prove that races exist biologically and that we can uh, attribute certain cultural traits as well as innate biological biological traits like intelligence to race. Um, so anthropology in its very early days kind of has a very dark history in terms of how it operated. It wasn't really until the mid 19th, uh, 19th century when we have a gentleman named Franz Boas that we really get to this kind of the real heart of how anthropology is today, right? So uh, Boas himself founded the first American School of Anthropology at the University of Chicago, which is actually still in operation today in 1896. Um, he championed the ethnographic method during his field work amongst the Kwakiatl people of the Northwestern United States. And we're actually going to talk about the Kwakiatl indigenous tribe um, quite a bit because they provide a lot of really good classic examples of some of these different cultural elements that anthropologists look at. So Boaz made two major contributions to modern anthropological theory that still hold validity today. He developed the notion of cultural relativism and he debunked biological determinism, right? And he asserted that cultural study is in fact a science that you can look at a culture and examine it from an objective scientific viewpoint. So if we look at Boaz's contributions to anthropological theory, he came up with the notion of cultural relativism, which is defined as understanding a group's beliefs, 
living structure and traditions within their own cultural context without making judgment or placing value on their cultural practices. He also developed and debunked the notion of biological determinism, which is the notion that all attributes of a person are innate, right, or biological, including intelligence, brain size, et cetera. And we're actually going to talk about a study um, that Boaz did at Ellis Island where he went in and measured the physical attributes, um, stature, height, weight, things like that, of incoming immigrants, and then went later, um, about 10 years later, and measured the attributes of those immigrants' children, right, the first generation to be born in the United States. And the major um, kind of discovery of this was that the children who were born in the United States and had grown up so far living on a United States diet and things like that actually had um, the same body proportions as people who were born within the United States and whose families had been living in the United States for generations upon generations. So um, what Boaz really did was prove this link that really our biology is heavily affected by our environment and our diet rather than strictly our um, genes. He also founded what's called the Historical Particularism School within anthropology, which rejects the notion of cultural evolution, instead arguing that each society and culture is a collective representation of its own unique historical past. And what Boaz was saying was not that cultures do not evolve and change over time because we all know that cultures do. What he's saying is that we cannot say that all human cultures go along this strict trajectory moving from one stage of evolution to the next, right? It just doesn't work that way. So to give you a little more um, kind of details on Boazian research that occurred at Ellis Island, um, Boaz essentially uh, set out to test Darwinian evolution, and he wanted to provide a refutation of Samuel Morton's notion of craniometry that all particular races have a certain subsect of cranial and skeletal measurements that are uniform across a quote-unquote uh, race. And Boaz wanted to refute this because Boaz, even knowing, you know, just by his own studies going out into various cultures and various groups amongst the native North Americans, knows that there's a huge wide variety even within a given quote-unquote race in terms of your skeletal proportions, right? So he really wanted to refute this notion of race in general as well, that race itself is not biological, rather a social construct. So what Boaz did was he studied 18,000 immigrants. He looked at their skull sizes as well as limb proportions as they were coming into Ellis Island, and he found that American skull sizes vary significantly from those of European or African. In essence, uh, American skull sizes were much larger, right? And at the time, most anthropologists would say, well, larger skull size means automatically bigger brain, which means automatically smarter than these incoming Europeans and Africans. Well, Franz Boas didn't believe that, right? He didn't believe that intelligence was a innate aspect, right? He believed that it was environment and diet that really affected um, some of your biological aspects. So he found that children born 10 years after the parents' arrival in the U.S. had American-sized uh, skull proportions, right? So in essence, it really was that diet that determines what your skeletal proportions are. So from Boaz himself, he says that the behavior of an individual is determined not by his racial affiliation, by, but by the character of his ancestry and his cultural environment. So to go into a little more detail about biological determinism, which was the kind of major prevailing um, thought in anthropology um, during the time that Boaz was doing his research, right? So for much of that 19th century, European as well as American scientists were trying to enforce this dogma, which asserted you can rank humans based on race and that intelligence directly corresponds to race, right? And the example that we've already talked about was the American physician Samuel Morton, who measured a bunch of skulls. And I, don't, I won't get into all the details um, in the nitty gritty, but let's just say that he essentially used very unscrupulous statistical testing as well as a ridiculously small sample size to make these very broad statements about uh, skull size and intelligence, right? And when later scientists, um, Stephen Jay Gould in particular, ran uh, Samuel Morton's number and corrected for the bias that his statistical test included, um, it actually found quite the opposite of what Morton reported. Cause Morton originally reported that Africans have much smaller brain size and much smaller skull sizes than 
um, Europeans or Americans, therefore, saying that, well, it's okay that racism exists because uh, people of color are just not that smart. Well, when they reran those numbers, Stephen Jay Gould actually found out that the reality of the situation is actually the opposite. In terms of skull sizes, Africans and some aboriginal populations, as well as populations in South America, actually do have larger skull sizes um, than Europeans and Americans. But I caveat this by saying in modern biology, we know that there is a wide degree of variation between um, all members of a specific grouping of humans, right? So, you know, really what we kind of say is that there's a lot of variation in humans in general, right? So if we look at another kind of researcher named Ernest Hooten, he used Morton's craniometry and said that racial traits are a matter of inheritance. And he sat on the Committee of the Negro, which was founded by Congress to prove essentially racial inferiority in the United States. And he was a large supporter of the eugenics movement, which we'll talk about in much more detail later on in the semester. And from his work directly, he says, there is no anthropological ground, whatever, for selecting any so-called racial group or any ethnic or national group or linguistic or religious group for preferment of condemnation. Our real purpose should be to segregate and eliminate the unfit, worthless, degenerate, and antisocial portion of each racial and ethnic strain within our population so that we may utilize these substantial merits of the sound majority and the special and diversified gifts of its superior members. So in essence, what he's saying is that, yes, races do exist, and yes, there are good and bad members of each race, and we should prevent the bad members of each race from being able to breed, thus for uh, preventing those bad deleterious traits from passing on to the next generation. And as we will learn when we talk about evolution in this course, we're going to learn that uh, guided breeding like that and um, kind of eugenics doesn't really work that way. And we know that genetics doesn't work that way. If we were to do selective breeding like that in humans, what it would end up doing is reduce our genetic variation, which would lead us more susceptible to genetic disease that could spread through the population within a few given generations. So continuing on uh, talking about Ellis Island, Boa has debunked biological determinism by conducting various IQ tests as well as bodily measurements on incoming immigrants on Ellis Island. Um, and he determined that intelligence is not correlated with ethnicity, race, or nationality. So when you see these things kind of in, in this older scientific literature that's saying you can directly correspond intelligence to race, it's not, it doesn't really have a good solid biological or scientific foundation. What they are doing is taking a cultural pattern and asserting that it has a biological foundation, right? Um, for example, in the 1990s, you have the book called The Bell Curve, which asserted that, well, there's a certain group of people within a given population that are automatically smarter than the rest. And that's how we kind of fit on that normal curve. Well, that's not really reflective of the actual reality that certain school districts within our country have variable resources, which will lead to variable qualities of education, which will, of course, lead to, quote, unquote, variable levels of intelligence, right? So it's not really a biological innateness in terms of intelligence and performance. It's really the environmental uh, resources that are available to these different school districts. Our next anthropologist that we'll talk about is kind of a contemporary um, of Franz Boas, Bronislaw Malinowski. He further popularized the uh, research technique of participant observation as well as the um, efficacy of ethnographic study, right? He really kind of fathered um, kind of ethnology as well, kind of comparing different ethnographies together. He spent time among the Trobriand Islanders in the South Pacific studying the Kula Ring. The Kula Ring is a system of Aboriginal exchange that was practiced amongst these Islanders, and it's a system of reciprocity that spanned for more than a thousand miles amongst a series of islands. Um, and we're going to talk about the Kula Ring in much more detail when we talk about economy later on in the semester here. Um, Malinowski himself was a Polish-born anthropologist who spent five years doing field work amongst those Trobriand 
Islanders, which provided him with a very unique opportunity to get a lot of really good cultural um, data, right? Because most anthropologists today, um, if they are even able to find a culture that requires a cultural description, um, really only spend about a year to maybe two years living with that culture. And even at five years, even at the time that Malinowski spent, you're still not getting everything that exists within that culture, right? Yeah, you'll get a pretty good idea of how they live their day-to-day -day lives, but what if in the year that you live there, nobody dies? Right, so you don't get that cultural practices of how they deal with death and how they bury their dead or how they deal with death um, afterwards. So um, you could be missing out on certain um, important life events that occur within a culture um, that may happen outside of the time that you are there. Our next researcher is Alfred Radcliffe Brown. And um, as we kind of move through this, you're going to realize that as anthropology develops, we start getting all these cultural descriptions and we start having the ability to come up with these kind of theoretical notions on how culture operates among humans, right? So he brought the ideas of function from the French sociologist Emile Durkheim to British anthropology. He developed the school of structural functionalism after his work on the Adaman Islands in 1908, looking at the, um, actually the practice of magic within the Adaman Islands. Um, his work focused on the cultural meanings behind rituals, rites of passage, and institutions. That's the functionalism part, where how do those institutions function within a given culture to enculturate um, the next generation, and how the aforementioned features construct cultural actively, right? This is the structural part. So in essence, what he's looking at is how institutions of culture actively construct culture itself. So structural functionalism is defined as a framework for building theory that sees society as a complex system whose parts work together to pro promote solidarity and stability through the use of cultural practices and institutions. So to kind of wrap up our kind of 19th century thought here, um, by the start of our 20th century, anthropology developed kind of into its own discipline with a whole host of various epistemological trends and debates, right? So remember, the goal of anthropology itself is understanding. We document culture so we can understand the impact cultural contact has on human society, right? Anthropologists do not place value on other cultures, nor do we judge cultural practices. So now that we've talked about some of the kind of early researchers in anthropology, um, and there are uh, quite a few more, I just kind of chose the ones that kind of provided the most contribution that we really um, still see operating within anthropology today. Uh, but you do have a whole host of other anthropologists that were working um, starting basically in the early um, 18th century all the way through um, to kind of where we're at now, which is our uh, kind of 20th century thought here. Um, but let's take a break from that for a second and look at kind of elements of culture so we can kind of better understand what it is these different social scientists are looking at when they look at human cultures. So culture contains three essential elements. You have norms, which are the ideas or rules of how an individual should act in a particular situation or towards another person. You have values, which are the fundamental beliefs about what is important in a culture, how to live life, and what is considered truth within a culture. And then, of course, you have symbols, which is something that means something else, right? For example, words are symbols that convey abstract meaning, right? And symbols are the way in which you convey or the way in which you transmit cultural information from one person to the next. So in anthropology, there are two essential or fundamental research strategies. Um, one is far more popular than the other. You have participant observation, which we've talked about before, which is simply living uh, in uh, kind of uh, living the day-to-day -day life with the group you are studying. Um, and then there, of course, is armchair anthropology. This is kind of the process of ethnology, right, which is taking multiple ethnographies and kind of comparing them together um, to kind of uh, come up with uh, general trends that we see in human cultures. Um, and each kind of has its merits, right? Participant observation, of course, provides us with the raw data that we need to kind of come up with good cultural descriptions. And armchair anthropology kind of pulls the scope back away from that individual culture and starts to look at broader trends and broader patterns that we see within our species as a whole.
So one of the fundamental things that uh, Boaz brought up that we still um, have in consideration with anthropology today is ethnocentrism, which was coined originally by Ludwig Gumplowitz in 1883. And Gumplowitz is essentially one of the founding members of the European School of Sociology. And he produced some of the first European anthropologists, although not in name, right? During this time, um, they were calling themselves sociologists, right? But a lot of those early sociologists in Europe ended up becoming um, very interesting integral and important in anthropological theory. So ethnocentrism, of course, is defined as the notion or belief that one's own culture and way of life is the best and appropriate way of living as a human, and that all other cultures are somehow doing it incorrectly. Um, but it can also go far beyond that, right? It's also kind of this notion of holding your culture above all others and even painting bad situations in a light that makes your culture look better. Um, the example I like to use is below you see a portrait of a painting um, or a painting that shows uh, the British Army actually fighting the Napoleonic Army um, during the Second Napoleonic Wars. And during this specific battle, although it kind of seems that the British are victorious, you can see all of their regiments in the background, and you can see kind of their, their vicious fighting in the foreground, and kind of the French are kind of a back... Uh, um, kind of bit player in this. And really what it's actually showing here is a battle that the British kind of won in spirit, but actually lost in real history, right? If we look back in the history books, the British actually lost this battle, but in order to kind of keep morale and kind of nationalism high in this kind of um, imperial age Britain, the artists at the time really kind of, when they depicted this particular battle, they really still depicted the British as being kind of triumphant and victorious, although they actually were not. So why is the concept of ethnocentrism in anthropology important? Well, it's kind of really the notion of recognizing the bias associated with ethnocentrism, which is key to how anthropologists approach studying culture, right? We try to view culture through their own cultural lens, which is how each culture interprets the world differently, right? And we try to keep in mind cultural relativism, which is understanding a group's beliefs and living structures and traditions within their own cultural context or their own cultural lens without making judgment or placing value or making some sort of value comparison between your own culture and the culture you are observing. But there are some kind of interesting theoretical conflicts here, right? If cultural relativism at its very base contradicts the notion that there could be such a thing as a cultural universal or something or some element that exists in all human cultures. But we do know that cultural universals exist, right? Language, for example, is a cultural universal. There is some form of language in all human cultures, as well as religion. Right? It's just the expression of those two things vary widely between cultures. So cultural relativism has its kind of usefulness and kind of keeping in mind that you shouldn't value or you shouldn't judge another culture. Um, but it kind of also has a disadvantage in the sense that if you hold to it in its firmest sense, there could be no such thing as a cultural universal because everything is so different from one another. So just showing you some of the cultural universals that we see, we have economics that exists in all cultures, some form of politics or power, art and aesthetics, religion, education, and of course, social arrangements like marriage and um, death ceremonies. All of these um, elements exist in every single culture. That's why we call them a cultural universal. If we look at our next kind of famous anthropologist that, um, provided or produced a lot of um, good linguistic studies um, on human cultures. Uh, we have Noam Chomsky, who was born on December 7th in 1928 in Philadelphia. His primary research interests include human evolutionary history, um, linguistics, social structures, as well as anarchism. Um, he's the author of over 100 books and articles, and he developed the theory of universal grammar. The theory of universal grammar, um, and remember, we call it a theory because it, it has a degree of scientific backing and evidence behind it, um, is that each human is born with the ability to learn and understand any spoken language, right? Language itself is a cultural universal, and that's why we think that, you know, children especially are able to pick up languages much more easily than adults, right? Because we are born with that ability, and that ability is hyper-activated when we're born, and through our early childhood 
childhood in order to acquire language skills um, very quickly. As part of that theory of universal grammar as well, Noam Chomsky says that all human grammar is recursive, which means that we can continually add on. Um, you get that with my hot winded, you know, long sentences that I give you while I'm giving you this lecture right now. It's the notion that you can say things like Billy threw the ball and Judy caught the ball and Judy ran away and uh, ran to the forest. And you can continually add on to your element of language there. Um, that is a universal in all human languages as well. And that's part of how language is constructed. Um, and just to give you a little Chomsky fun fact, Chomsky was actually placed on Richard Nixon's enemies list for his role in the counterculture movement in the 1960s. So in essence, there are many perspectives that, from which an anthropologist can interpret cultural practices and data. For sake of these, we refer to these kind of different perspectives as school of thought or anthropological theories. So the first theory that we'll talk about is the theory of cultural evolution, and it's, that itself has kind of evolved over the years here. In the early days, the kind of uh, progenitor of it was um, Lewis Henry Morgan in 1877, and he uh, came up with this notion while he worked amongst the Iroquois people. And Morgan thought that cultures evolved along a unilinear path, right, following a single trajectory, moving from savagery to barbarism to civilization, right? And this was based off of um, Charles Darwin, work as well as Thomas Malthus's work on demography, right? So what Morgan was really saying is that all human cultures start in this initial stage of savagery where you aren't farming, you're strictly hunting off the land, you're strictly gathering things off the land, and you don't have a whole lot of cultural practice and cultural complexity. Um, then you move to a stage of barbarism, which is where you start to farm the land, you begin to develop thing, technologies like pottery and more efficient hunting tools and things like that. Um, and then finally, you move on to the stage of civilization, which of course is quote unquote, European and American modern civilization, right? And you can kind of see how that can um, be construed to be very kind of socially laden, right? And it can kind of run you the risk of saying, well, you know, since European and American cultures are considered civilized, then all of these other cultures that we come across are not as civilized as we are. Therefore, we do not have to treat them as equally as we would treat members of our own culture. So later, we kind of had a redevelopment of cultural evolutionary theory by a gentleman named Ilman Service um, in 1971, and he developed a fluid trajectory for the evolution of culture. So he said that cultures evolve um, based on population from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to state-level societies. And what Service was really looking at was cultural complexity, right? He didn't really pick different elements that a culture had to have to move on, quote, to the next stage. Um, what he was looking at was really population size and how cultural complexity was displayed, right? So this is how we get um, things like the Maya, the ancient Maya in, Meso in Mesoamerica. Um, they are considered a state-level society based on their population size and their cultural complexity. But those people, you know, archaeologically, we know they didn't have um, even a basic technology like the wheel, right? So the Maya had a state level society, but didn't have certain technologies that we would consider um, part of quote unquote civilization. So this shows you how fluid um, cultural evolution can really be. Moving later on, we have Marvin Harris, um, who lived from 1927 to 2001, and he studied human rationale for religious practices in India and South America. And he refuted this notion of sociobiology, which is essentially biological determinism, right? So he coined the term hypodescent, marking a social pattern in the U.S. governmental policies. What he actually just showed um, was that in the U.S. governmental systems, particularly in a lot of the census systems in the states in the South, um, um, people of biracial couples or children of biracial couples were automatically being assigned to the kind of quote-unquote race of the minority parent. That is what is considered hypodescent. 
So to get into a little more detail here, in, um, during uh, Marvin Harris's time, um, primarily the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, um, in U.S. culture, racial identity, of course, is acquired at birth, right? It's what we consider a described status or a status that you are given at birth that you cannot change. It is not based on biology or simple ancestry. If you have a 50% of your DNA comes from an African-American mother and 50% from a Caucasian father, the child is automatically classified as black in the American system. System, right? So and really, this is just this kind of arbitrary classification system operate under a rule of descent, right, which assigns social identity based on ancestry. So if we were to define hypodescent, it's automatically placing children of mixed marriages in the group of their minority parent, which is essentially a very common practice in the United States, right? It's still practiced essentially today. Um, and effects of hypodescent, well, it divides the U.S. society into groups unequal in their access to wealth, power, and prestige, something that we are seeing playing out uh, or being brought to the forefront in our national um, spotlight in our national media today. Um, population growth is attributed more to minority categories than it is um, into uh, majority categories. Um, and it is easier for Native Americans and Hispanics to negotiate identity than it is for individuals of color like African Americans to negotiate identity. So African Americans or um, black people are more affected by the rule of hypo descent than other quote unquote racial categories. If we look at a famous rule or a famous case of hypo descent in the United States, um, one of them we use is uh, President Obama, who has a Kenyan father and a white American mother, but he is classified as quote unquote black or African American. We have um, the case of uh, Susie Gullery Phipps that happened in Louisiana. In some states, uh, anyone known to have any black ancestor can be classified as a member of the black race, right? So light-skinned women, um, or uh, if we look at uh, Miss Phipps, for example, she was a light-skinned woman with Caucasian features and uh, black hair. So she was raised white, and as an adult, she found out that she was part black from her birth certificate. And what she did was she challenged the Louisiana 132nd law, but lost, right? So it's a rare case because race is usually ascribed at birth and does not change. Hers was on her birth certificate, but she was raised based on her physical features, not her ancestry, right? So really, this just goes to prove that race is an arbitrary category that we create culturally, right? That's why we say that race is a social construct. Uh, so in the School of Functionalism, we've already kind of talked about these two gentlemen. You have um, Branislaw Malinowski, um, as well as uh, Alfred Radcliffe Brown. So in essence, if we look at functionalism and some of the work of Malinowski and Brown, um, functionalism, remember, it's that every behavior and institution within a culture has a specific function that supports the overall structure of the culture, right? Malinowski used this theory to interpret how Trobri and Islanders use magic and ritual to support subsistence structures. And it's actually a really kind of interesting story um, on its face value here. Um, Malinowski noticed that um, at certain points of the month, at midnight, the Trobrian Islanders would go through these rituals in which they um, went out into their gardens in the middle of night and would sing while they were weeding their gardens, right? And part of their religion actually became that, you know, those songs became kind of magic that allowed the plants to grow a little bit larger and produce a little bit more. Um, they actually call it yam magic because yams are the uh, primary crop there on the Trobriand Islands. Um, so in essence, what uh, Malinowski noticed was that the islanders had developed this entire religious system that revolved around um, this kind of uh, very upgraded or kind of very um, robust gardening routine that they were doing. And the reason for that is, you know, on the Trobian Islands, you don't have a whole lot of game animals. You don't have a whole lot of, you know, you do have some ocean resources like fish, but you really want to kind of keep your gardens nice and you want to keep that kind of ability for your gardens to continue to produce year after year. So they developed an entire religion around growing yams that really supports those gardens continuing to develop. This is an image showing you where the Trobrian Islands are. So they're a little bit um, east of Papua New Guinea in the South Pacific, uh, actually closer to what we call the Solomon Sea. 
And um, you get a wide variety amongst the Trobriand Islanders. Some of them have adopted modernity um, using kind of Western clothing, um, as well as kind of some Western economic practices. You can see this gentleman here holding a newspaper, and he has a little stand that he's selling um, various fruits and things like that to tourists that come to the island. Um, but you also have Trobriand Islanders who still live a more traditional um, kind of way of life that we'll see here on the next slide. This image is showing you the Trobrian Islanders. These are all the girls who are of marriage age, and um, they do this whole kind of ceremony during a marriage ceremony where the girls who are still kind of quote unquote single and are, are able to be married will carry yams over to the ceremony grounds and they will begin to kind of do a special dance. Um, which kind of indicates to all of the younger men that we are still single and we are looking for uh, marriage proposals. Moving on to our next school of thought, we have structuralism, which was developed by Jean-Claude Levi Strauss, and he says that all culture can be interpreted based on its structure. It rejects the focus of functionalism um, and instead kind of pulls everything back and says that we can really only determine what a very base amorphous structure of a culture actually is. And um, what's kind of interesting is although Levi Strauss published many books and became kind of a prominent figure in anthropology, um, his theories tend to be very generalized and abstract, and he also ignores the role that power, politics, and agency play in culture. An example that I can give you is that in the early days, um, Strauss wrote about how um, first societies were formed and how, you know, human groups originally would communicate with one another. And Strauss said that the original structure of intergroup communication was solely for building alliances using marriages, right? So um, kind of Levi Strauss asserted that men exerted their power by trading women to different human groups um, to kind of build alliances, right? And you can kind of see how that is, well, one, a little bit sexist, and two, kind of... Um, Eh, not really reflective of what the actual history, yes, I'm sure many early societies built alliances, but it was not men solely trading women back and forth between each other to kind of favor one another. It's a little more culturally complex um, than Strauss would have you believe. So structuralism puts heavy focus on symbols, right? So if we consider this object here, we have, of course, the physical sign, the metal, the paint, the reflective coating, this is considered the material part, right? And the message the sign conveys, to stop is the symbolic part, right? So it is a shared symbolism so that all members of the same culture know the meaning of the sign and are able to act accordingly, right? This is structuralism, looking at both the physical representation within the culture as well as the symbolic meaning behind that physical representation or that structure. So then moving on a little bit later in time, we have Clifford Geertz, who founded the School of Symbolic Anthropology um, in the 1970s. And the, what the uh, symbolic anthropology does is it seeks to illuminate the connection between ordinary everyday activities and the deep cultural meanings behind those activities, right? So in essence, actions are also symbols which convey meaning to other members of your culture. And the case study that I like to use is um, uh, Clifford Geert's original kind of ethnographic study amongst the Balinese, and what he looked at was the practice of cockfighting. And this is used to illustrate the notion of actions as symbols. Geertz looked at this practice in Bali and noticed that cockfighting was not simply just the act of having two animals fight one another. There was actually much more symbolic and cultural meaning behind that fight than simply winning some money. So from Geertz's own mouth, he says that Balinese cockfighting is not just Balinese cockfighting, right? The cockfight itself represents generations worth of competition between prominent cockfighting families within local villages in Bali. It also represents the negotiation of those families' power, prestige, and ability to garner resources within the village they live, right? So i.e. cockfighting is much more than the act of having two animals fight one another for sport. So as a kind of fun fact for you, they spit on the roosters uh, right before the fight to enrage them and make them better fighters. <laughs> 
So rounding full circle, we've kind of talked about all of these different structural theories like functionalism and structural functionalism um, and structuralism that all looks at kind of how is culture comprised, right? Well, we the kind of most modern um, theoretical trend that we see is something we refer to as postmodernism, right? Which is really a return to Boasian anthropology or the original notion of historical particularism. So postmodernist anthropologists seek to illuminate the uniqueness and complexity of each culture, right? And they reject the generalized notions of functionalism and structuralism. So if we look at an example of postmodernist anthropologists, we have um, a, he was a kind of a self-considered neo-Marxist historian named Eric Hobsbawm. Um, and what he looked at is he examined tradition and nationalism in nation states. And what he found out was that a lot of these quote unquote traditions that really bolster nationalism are not actually as old as we in modern time would like to think. Um, the example he likes to use is the uh, coronation procession of the British monarchy, um, which actually was not really a common practice. It was, wasn't until the, um, really up until Victoria that you got this big pomp and circumstance in the royal coronation uh, kind of procession going from one city to the next and being crowned. Um, Queen Victoria is what really popularized that use. Also, another good example would be, um, talking about Queen Victoria, the use of a white wedding dress. Right, white wedding dresses are kind of considered synonymous with weddings today and are considered quote unquote traditional, yet they are less than 150 years old in terms of hu being used in human marriages. Um, it was really Queen Victoria who popularized the use of a white wedding dress, right? Before that, white fabric was very expensive, it was difficult to keep clean, and most women could not afford to have a special dress made um, for their wedding. So other contemporary theories that we see today is the notion of globalization, which uh, proposes that the world needs to be viewed as a single global culture, a human culture, and this is based on the spread of neoliberalist economic policies, which we'll talk about much later in the uh, semester. We also have neo-Marxism, which is a renewed focus on the roles of agency and power within cultural formation. How does an individual's agency and how does power influence the development of cultural institutions? Right. These are kind of the two new um, or not so new, but, you know, kind of the most popular uh, theoretical trends that we see today. And with that, that kind of concludes our talk about uh, our brief overview of the history of anthropological thought. And we'll revisit kind of these theorists as well as their theories as we move throughout the semester and look at the different cultural elements that these theorists focused on.